how do you define like what you do? You're not a motivational speaker. Like where do you fall in what, what, like what bucket would you say you fall in, in terms of what you do for a living? I'm just, let's just start with the, with that. And then we're going to delve into hopefully lots of other stuff. So, I mean, my, my immediate reaction is to say I'm an optimist. You know, I, I, I define myself by who I am, not what I do. And I think that one of the big challenges that a lot of people face is they, they intertwine their identity with their work. Yeah. Right? I am a lawyer, you know, yeah. uh, I am a fitness coach or whatever, you know, somebody mm -hmm. wants to do. And then if you lose that job by your choice or not your own choice, or if you have great success and you get older and you decide to leave and retire or do something else, I see a lot of people have an identity crisis because they no longer do the thing that they did. Yeah. And so I don't mind what I do uh, because I get to be an optimist in everything that I do. Um, uh, and I, you know, I've, the way I live my life is, is I, I live completely focused with a vision that is extremely far away, completely, I'll never get there. You know, I imagine a world in which the vast majority of people wake up every single morning inspired, feel safe wherever they are and end the day fulfilled by the work that they do. And for me, the objective is to figure out all the ways that I can to start moving closer and closer towards that world. And so um, for the better part of the last, you know, decade or more, I, I bet on the on leaders. I believe that the leaders, the best bet that we have to get to that world that I imagine, that if we can find and celebrate and support the kinds of leaders who can build great organizations uh, where people feel like they belong, that feel like they're contributing something bigger than themselves, then we are more likely to get to that world, right? Now, what's my role in that? Again, completely agnostic. I never ever imagined that I would be uh, an author. I was never one of those people who thought I had a book in them, you know? Mm -hmm. And after uh, every book I've written, uh, I've said, okay, that's probably my last one. And I said that after the first one, you wow. know? Um, uh, but here I am an author because the opportunity um, uh, showed up that I thought, oh, this is a good way to move towards that vision, right? Um, then people would invite me to speak about my ideas. And I thought, okay, never ever wanted to be a public speaker didn't even know that was a career, <laughs> you know, it's That's true. I, right? I, 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 uh, um, uh, I actually am more of a behind the scenes person. I've never desired to be in the front of a proscenium. Um, but when the opportunities presented themselves, I thought, well, this is a very good way for me to spread this message right. and to spread this vision. And so, so when you ask me, what do I do? I do anything that I need to do to advance towards that vision these days. I'll write books and I'll speak about it. Um, but who knows what the next five years will look like. It could be completely, completely different. Well, oh my, okay, so in, in that one answer, I have now Isn't that questions. annoying that you say, what do you do? And it takes me 30 minutes to yeah, answer. Yeah, exactly. I, have, I actually have a friend who did a TED talk on this. Like when someone asks you that question of what do you do yeah. to how to like do an elevator pitch. Well, I can tell you what I say on an airplane. If somebody says, what okay, do you do? Okay, yeah, tell me what you I, say I, on an airplane. I say I teach leaders and organizations how to inspire people. All right, that's good. And if they believe what I believe, they say, inspiration, that's cool. How do you do that? And we can talk about my work for as long as they can stand it. Um, and if they don't believe what I believe, they say, what kind of company? What kind of, what kind of organizations? So it's a great filter. Yeah. Immediately, I know if they're on the same wavelength as me or not. Do people recognize you in airplanes? Uh, these days, yeah. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Well, okay, first of all, my I guess to go back even further than I was going to, was did you even when your Ted talk is probably what the number two or three most viewed of all time, right? Like 80 million, a hundred million by now, it's, something it's, insane. It's, I don't know. I don't know if it's that high, but yeah, it's, it's, it's done high. well. Yeah. It's pretty. And then of course being, I'm sure it's actually even higher because it's been shared and shared and shared. Right. But, yeah. but were you even shot? Like, how did that even like, cause that takes you, I did a Ted talk recently, uh, a couple years ago, and that was considered a viral TED talk with like 5 million or 6 mm -hmm. million. And that mm -hmm. like put my life on a different trajectory. Mm -hmm. I can't even imagine with your type of success in that TED talk, would you, mm -hmm. were you completely floored mm -hmm. at like the response that it, that it had? Yes and no is the simple answer. Okay. <laughs> 
I had been- Is there ever a simple answer with you? Sometimes. Okay. <laughs> the answer is yes and no. You know, I had been giving versions of that talk for three years oh. before I actually did the TEDx. Okay. I'd never done it that short. Right. You know, there were hour long versions. And so I knew that the message had resonance. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, and I'd been asked so many of the difficult questions that I'd worked out a lot of the kinks and the thinking. So I knew that the message had resonance. And I knew that people liked it. So, so I knew that. Okay. But I never expected uh, this, this rinky dink TED talk, TEDx talk that I did in, you know, in a hangar in Puget Sound with like a 50 or 100 people in the room you know, where the camera wasn't, it's very low quality. Right. You know, my microphone breaks in the middle of me talking, you know. Me too. You know, <laughs> like literally, they like trading out mics, you know. Uh, I remember seeing that. That was hilarious. Yeah. And, and it's living proof that things can go wrong and it'll be fine. Yeah. Uh, uh, totally fine. So I, I, I didn't know that the TEDx talk would do what it did. Okay. And back then it was unheard of to put a TEDx on the main TED website. So they only put them on YouTube. Right. And there was a separate page for TEDx talks just on YouTube, you know, right. and then the main TED talks would just be on the TED, TED.com. And it very quickly became the most watched TEDx of all. And then they put it on TED.com. And I only found out that they were going to do that a week before they did it. So, and then it continued to grow, you know, extremely fast. So yeah, that was all a shock to me. That was all a surprise to me. I never, I knew the, the message had resonance. I, I, resonance. I never knew that it was gonna do that. that. That was a surprise, yeah. So before you did that, I mean, you said you were doing these big, these talks anyway. So yeah. you were already doing public speaking yeah. at some level, right? Yeah. So what, so just walk me through, cause I'm actually <laughs> very curious about you before you, do you know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like, that's what I'm really kind of curious about. So you didn't, you were like disgruntled with your career a little bit, right? I wouldn't say disgruntled. I'd, I'd, didn't I, love it. I'd fallen out of love. Yeah. Okay. I was, I had no passion for my career. Okay. And this was a chosen career. Like I started my own business in a category in a profession that I thought I wanted to spend the rest of my life in consulting Mar marketing. Oh, okay. I thought it was, you cool. know, and, uh, and to wake up one morning, with a superficially good life. I own my own business. We had amazing clients. We did really good work. Our clients liked us and didn't want to do it anymore. Right. It's kind of distressing because as I, as I said, where we started, you know, so many of us intertwine our identities with our work. And if I don't like my work, then who am I? Right. And so I went through that, um, which uh, was incredibly unfun. Um, and it was the discovery of this, of this little idea that I called the golden circle you know, where we all know what we do. Some of us know how we do it, but very few of us know why we do what we do. And I realized I didn't know why I was doing what I was doing. Um, and it was, uh, it was that crisis that was designed to do nothing more than help me find my own passion to get back my, my mojo um, that put me in a path that was um, unexpected. Um, uh, my, my entire career is an accident, you know? It's amazing. Um, I'm, I am a living proof that, uh, that you can, that you don't have to have a plan. <laughs> right, 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 exactly. And it worked out for you, right? <laughs> you have to have a vision, you have to have a vector, you have to have a direction, but you definitely don't need to know the individual steps. So you kind of answered earlier, well, before I even go into that, you said something in, in when your first answer to me, which I thought was interesting, that you're not defining yourself by uh, what you do, but the problem I find in today's time anyway, it's very, everything's kind of very much dovetails, like who you are, what you do, what you do is really who you are. So mm -hmm. you become friends with the people you work with or mm -hmm. who are aligned with what you do. Mm -hmm. There's very little separation in that. So I'm, I'm interested in how you, in what, how are you able to like compartmentalize that a little bit? You know what I mean? Because I find it very difficult. Like what I do, it's not, two things happen. I think that other people compartmentalize you as well. So if I was a health and fitness person, mm -hmm. but I'm also this thing and that thing and that thing, the other, like outside from that, people pigeonhole you. So it's very hard to break away. Mm -hmm. You're saying that like, you're, you're not really defined by what you do, but you know, what you want or how it, like you're being an optimist. Mm -hmm. How, 
how, what kind of advice or what do you suggest for other people out there? Because I think that there's a lot of confusion and people do get pigeonholed mm -hmm. and, or they don't know the different, like they are, they're confused because like mm -hmm. you said, they are what they do. Mm -hmm. And so there's no distinction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I still get pigeonholed, you know, um, people know me as the thing that is familiar, you know? And, um, so I remember in the early days, you know, when the only thing I could talk about was starting with wine. Yeah. Um, when I started to have more ideas and different ideas and I would pitch to these, um, prospective, uh, engagements, I'd like to talk about something new. They'd all say no, because, right. Because they wanted me to do the thing that they knew was good. They wouldn't let me try something new. And yeah. so, um, I, I, I just arbitrarily picked one and basically didn't do as I was told and decided to do something new on the stage. And I think there's an, and I'm, you know, I'm not advoc I'm not saying there's a one size fits all here. You know, there's a there's a risk tolerance, but I like testing things in real life. Um, you know, many of my ideas um, are from real life scenarios, where I, I, it's not like practice, practice, practice. Okay, it's ready for the real world now. Um, you know, there have been more than one occasion where I've walked out on stage and go, okay, they 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 brought me in to do talk about this, but I'm having some new ideas. Are you guys okay if I try talking about this? It might completely fail. I just wanted to get some, you know, some and like people, especially you pick your audiences, you pick a room full of entrepreneurs. Right. You know, they're fine with it. You know? Right, right, right. Uh, if I pick a room full of engineers, maybe not, you know? Right. Uh, but maybe not, you know, maybe engineers are fine with that too. Um uh and so and then I would try new things. And um and you know I, I think I think what makes it work. It's very often when we do these things, we show up with a selfish disposition, right? I hope they like me. Mm -hmm. I hope they like my work. I hope they buy my book. I hope they, you know, go to my website. I hope they follow me on social media. Right. And, and we act that way. You know, we put a, a picture behind us on the PowerPoint and it has our, all of our social media handles on it and it has a phone number and, an, and a website and an email address. Right. And we say at the end, you know, somebody asks a question is like, you know, question, whatever. And they, and we reply, well, you'll have to read my book or, well, that's on, that's from my book, you know? And it's like, it's, we, we put ourselves and that's, people can tell. And in those cases, we're not rooting for you. In fact, we're going to try and trip you up because right. we can't help ourselves. It's entertaining. Yes. You know, you put yourself at the front, we'll have fun with that. And so I've, I've learned early to show up with a giver's mentality, um, where I don't care if, uh, if they like me, I don't care if they buy a book. I don't care if they follow me on social media or not. All I know is, is I have something that I think is really valuable and I'm going to give it to you. I want to give it to you. And I believe and I'm giving it to you with all of my gusto and all of my energy. And so like, I, I remember, you know, people would apologize because they, you know, they said there's going to be this size event and like only half the number of people showed up and they're apologizing. And I know a lot of speakers who would get angry. You promised me this size audience. And I was like, well, I just feel sorry for the people who didn't show up because the people who did show up are going to get all of me. Right. You know, um, I hold back nothing. Um, and I think when you show up with a giver's heart, and I literally will say that before I go out on a stage, I will literally say under my breath before I step on the stage, you're here to give. I will remind myself that what I'm about to do is, is an act of generosity. I think I have something pretty and I want to share it. And people can tell. Yeah. Authenticity. You know? People can tell. And so you, you have a wide berth when you show up with a giver's heart. You can make mistakes and you can stumble over your words and you can, you can talk a little bit too much like I am right now. And people are just fine with it. Yeah. You know? Um, so I, I think, you know, we're highly attuned social animals. And if you show up to give, you, you, you can, you, believe it or not, you can, you can experiment a lot. How do you, how can someone change that though, right? Like if you're innately someone who doesn't think like that, right? Like I'm here to give, cause you're right. Like human, I think human nature, so I want to sell my book, go, go check out my handle, do this, do that, do that. How do you shift like your, your mindset? How do you, can you train your brain to think differently like that? Yeah. So it is authentic because you by just saying it doesn't make it so no, correct. Right. Uh, the, 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 of course you can train yourself. Like, uh, I, I wish I could be healthy, but you know, there's so many things and I'm just not a healthy person. And you know, can I ever be healthy? Of course, of course, 
you just practice it like you just start. Yes, of course. And it may not work the first five or 10 times. You know, you go to the gym a bunch of times in the row, you will see no results. Right. You know, it, it, like these things sometimes take time. It's the same. You know, I, the best I can sum it up when I really started to learn this lesson was um, uh, many years ago, I had a, a meeting at the Pentagon of all places with a big fancy general. And I was waiting in the, in the foyer, just waiting for, for him. And have you ever had it where you, where you go to a meeting or in a or, or, Pentagon? No. Well, I mean, you, <laughs> you've had meetings um, and somebody comes to get you yeah. to take you to the conference room or the, or the, or the, or the, or, or the or office or whatever. Yeah. And you have hallway talk because walking quietly down a hallway is too uncomfortable. Yeah. And so you have hallway talk, which is nonsense. It's things like, how's, you know, hot day out today? <laughs> or did you have an easy trip? <laughs> totally. You know, and yes, it's just, yes, yes. it's just nonsense. And as soon as you walk into the room, that ceases, right? Well, that's what happened to me. The general came to get me and we were walking back to his office and the hallway talk ensued. And he said, you know, Simon, um, I had everyone in my office read your book. And I said, my publisher thanks you. And he said, tell them not to bother. I had them read my copy. That's what he said to that's you? That's what he said to me. So I learned total book sales, one. <laughs> yeah. Total impact, huge. Yeah. Versus I go to an event and they give away 500 free copies of mm -hmm. my book, but they use them as you know coasters and doorstops. Total book sales, 500. Total impact, zero. And so I had to learn that it's not always easy to measure the impact that we have in the short term. Now, I know over the long term, book sales do, are a reflection of the value of my ideas and whether people want them. Otherwise, it would just stop selling. Like I know over the time, but in the short term, literally, it tells me nothing. And I think too many of us confuse that the short term impacts that we're having are producing long-term value or conversely having no short-term impact means we're having no value. Mm -hmm. And so I treat it like exercise, which is, which is um, uh, I know that proce the process matters. So for example, you can't go to the gym for nine hours and get into shape. It literally doesn't work, mm -hmm. right? No matter how much effort you put in. But if you work out every single day for 20 minutes, guaranteed 100% you will get into shape. Right. When will you get into shape? No clue. Right. Over no time. one knows over time. And everyone's different. Some people a little quicker, some people a little slower. And yet we are 100% sure, 100%. It'll 100% work. I just don't know when. And we're also obsessed with predicting when. It has to be this quarter. It has to be the end of the year. It has to be when we pay taxes. It has whatever it is. Like, you know, and, and I got very comfortable saying, I know that if I stick to the process, I work out every day for 20 minutes. I know 100% it's going to work, and I have to get comfortable that I have no control over when. Mm -hmm. Some, sometimes quicker, sometimes slower. And so the things that I wrote about in Start With Why mm -hmm. is the game plan that I have followed since I first wrote about it, since I first started talking about it. I do start with why. When somebody says, what do you do? I don't tell them what I do. I tell them what I believe. And I wrote about the law of diffusion of innovations, mm -hmm. which is a religion for me. And explain what that is. So all populations sift across the standard deviation, the whole the, the, the old bell curve, right? If you have high performers in a population, you're gonna have low performers, you're gonna have an average, always, mm -hmm. right? What the law of diffusion tells us is that the first two and a half percent of any population are your innovators. These are your big idea people, right? Then the next uh, about 13 and a half percent of your population are early adopters. These people are very comfortable um, spending extra money, time, energy, making some sort of sacrifice to be a part of something that's bigger than themselves, that reflects who they are. Then you have the majority, the early majority and the late majority, a little more cynical, a little more practical. You know, what's in it for me? Um, will I get my money back if it doesn't work? You know, will I get in trouble? You know, that kind of thing, you know, a little more risk averse. And then finally, the last 16%, you have your laggards. The only reason they do anything is because you basically don't have a choice anymore. Right. What the law of diffusion tells us is that if you wanna have mass market success, if you want an idea to spread or be sticky, um, you have to achieve between uh, 15 and 18% market penetration. And then a social phenomenon happens called a tipping point. And it just goes. But because most of us want the majority, we aim all of our efforts at the majority, which actually doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Because the majority will not try something new until somebody else has tried it first. Right. And so as soon as I learned that, I became obsessed 
with early adopters. And, you know, I get accused now, people say, oh, but you can afford to turn work down. I'm like, no, 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 I've been targeting work down when I was leaving, living hand to mouth. Like I needed every gig I could get because I was broke and I had no money in my bank account. Like you were oh, totally. Yeah. I mean, I was literally living paycheck to paycheck. And, and I, when was this? I mean, just when I first discovered Start With Why, I remember I, I did, walked away from a marketing business that I had a lot of passion for, yeah. for uh, lost passion for. When I discovered this Start With Why thing, I decided to make myself the guinea pig and I shut down my marketing company. So I, I had no discernible. So you did shut, shut it down. I was yeah. gonna ask you that. I shut it down. I had no discernible, I had, lot, I had no discernible income. And so I was, I was literally like scraping it together. Um, but you had clients, you just decided I did, one day- I walked away I just, from them. You just didn't want to do it anymore. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so it wasn't uh, for because like the business was like flailing. It I mean, it was flailing because when you have no passion for something, well, turns out it makes it a lot harder. Right, right, So I mean, right, it's, it's, you know, it's like, yes, I'd lost my passion, the business was flailing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, I probably wouldn't have gone out of business, but it definitely felt that way, right. you know? But- um, uh, You're turning down all this business. So, so I'll give you a real life example. You know, I got very, very good at discerning who was a believer and who wasn't, who was early adopter and who wasn't. So go back to the, the elevator pitch. Mm -hmm. You know, what do you do? I teach leaders and organizations how to inspire people. If they hear the word inspire, okay, they believe what I believe. If they don't hear the word inspire, they don't believe what I believe, right? It's, it's what wavelength, are we on the same wavelength? And I remember, I actually, this is a true story. I remember somebody, had, this was early days, there was no start with why book, there was no start with why TED talk. And I was just sort of like trying to figure it out and I was doing consulting, um, doing why discovery stuff. And uh, I remember a guy called me and he said, um, I got your phone number from someone. Uh, convince me why I should hire you. Right? And I did not go into sales pitch mode because what went through my head is this guy's not an early adopter. This guy will not help me spread my message. This guy is, mm -hmm. he wants to be convinced. And I literally said, um, I, can't, I can't help you. He goes, come on, convince me. I said, there's nothing I can say or do that will convince you that you and I should work together. I'm the wrong, I'm the wrong guy for you, right? And I never worked with him. Now I needed the client, but he was the wrong client. And I'd rather struggle just a little bit longer to find the right person to work with. Because when I found the right people to work with, even if I made a little less money, what they did is they told five people about me or 10 people about me, but they did more than that. They told the right people about me. Right. Or they made introductions by saying, Simon, there's somebody you need to meet. And they would tell their friends, you need to meet this person. Right, which is way more powerful than me saying anything that Absolutely. if it comes from an objective third party. And so other people were responsible for my message spreading, other people responsible for the people I met, other people responsible for helping me t sell the book. You know, I had no s PR machine or anything like that. Right. It was people, you know, I remember going in the early days, I would ask the audience, you know, how many of you have seen the TED talk? And a lot of people raised their hands and I said, how many people were sent it by someone else? And that number is usually around 75%. So these people weren't even Tedsters. Right. You know, somebody said, oh my God, you know who would love this? And they would send it to their friend. Yeah. And that's all the law of diffusion. And so there's nothing that I'm doing that's mythical or magical, right? Um, there's social phenomena that I've written about, other people have written about. The law of diffusion is not my idea. It's em Emmett Rogers right. from the 1960s, you know? Um, um, the only thing that I did, like anything that works, is I had the discipline to do it. That's right? right. You want to get into shape, you have to have the discipline to do it. You want to be healthy, you have to have the discipline to do it. And so, and you have to get comfortable that you cannot predict when success happens. You just have to believe that the process works and you stick to the process. That's all I did. And everything that I did is written about in that book. Yeah. That's literally the, the thing that I followed. So you actually, so you believe, number one, and you had the discipline to kind of follow it through. It's hard to turn down. Now, look, it's not a perfect system. Like yeah. even somebody who's very healthy sometimes wants to have a big piece of chocolate cake. Yes. But you do it with eyes wide open. Mm -hmm. Like you know this puts you slightly out of balance. Mm -hmm. You know that it, you might have to do a little extra work to get it mm -hmm. out of your system. And you also know you can do it now and then, but you can't do it every day. Right. Right? So did I do business with clients I shouldn't have? Of course I did. Right, but, only human for God's sake. But and or if I needed to pay bills, right? But I did it with eyes wide open, not believing that this was going to like set me up. And I was doing it for a short term because I needed a, a little infusion of sugar, right? You know, <laughs> and I knew not to do it too often. So it's it's the same mentality. 
Yeah, it is the same mentality. It's just very hard to do. And people like to take the short term gratification, quick fix all the time, especially in today's time. I feel like I don't know what I do know what you think, but I feel like when I grew up, <laughs> you know, I do know what you think. It was a different mentality like than it, than it is today. Like people's work ethic isn't as as strong, if I was to be honest, what mm -hmm. I think. Um, what I call it's very much like a coddle culture type mm -hmm. of world right now where uh, everyone like, always gets a participation trophy. Mm -hmm. People are offended very easily. It's very, very different. Mm -hmm. It's hard to, I feel, it's hard to lead in a world like that. And it's hard to like work in a world like that when you have so many Thing, I feel so many constraints around mm -hmm. the other people, right? Like nobody wants, nobody wants to work, but also nobody wants to, nobody, nobody wants to be given direction. Everyone wants to be a leader. Everyone wants to be an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. but yet nobody wants mm -hmm. to put in the discipline, the hard work and the effort. Mm -hmm. Have you noticed this might yourself, even though you are very optimistic about of course. people? <laughs> of course. Um, yeah, of course. I mean, each generation is different. They have their, you know, advantages and disadvantages. I think the thing that sums up all of those, what I would call symptoms mm -hmm. that you're listing is there's a, a deep ingrained impatience mm -hmm. in this younger generation that previous generations seem to have less of. You know, you, you suggest to a, uh, a young kid, why don't you take a gap year before college, you know, and the thought of taking a year off, literally what the thought that goes through their mind is, no, I'm, I might, then, then I'll be behind in my career. Right you know, um, missing the value that you actually bring from a year off mm -hmm. to go explore, travel, or, you know, um, work even. Um, or I have to have the perfect job out of the gate and everything has to go perfectly and I have to get promoted quickly because if I don't, I'm going to be behind. And, you know, you know, you're reaching 25, 26, 27 years old and having this quarter life crisis and, and panic, which, you know, previous generations didn't really have quarter life crises. Um, you know, um, where you feel like, oh my God, what my, what, what's my career? What's my life? You know, it's like, there's this strange impatience and it probably comes from growing up in a world of instant gratification, you know, where, you know, years before social media, if you wanted to go on a date, you know, first you had to meet them somewhere and you, right. you had to be like, Hey. Hey, you know? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and like you, the, somebody had to muster up the courage to ask and somebody had to muster up the courage to go. And it was, it took a little bit of time yes. to get a first date, a little bit of flirting, a little bit of, you had to learn something. Right. You know? Socialization. Socialization. Where now you just swipe right and I got a date instantly. Like right. I'm feeling a little lazy. I'm just, you know, there's nothing on TV. Oh, look, I got a date. Exactly. Right. Um, you know, shopping. You just go on Amazon and it literally shows up the next day. Or the same day. Or the same day yeah. in some cases. You know, even early online shopping, you know, you'd buy something and two weeks later it would show up, you know. Yeah, totally. And now it's now it's the next day. Um, uh, and we're kind of just used to that. Mm -hmm. We're kind of used to, ha you know, we even information. You know, like you're sitting at dinner and you're like, who is that actor? Hold on. You know, right. Or Alexa, who is so and so? Right. I have unlimited access to unlimited yeah. information. I did that with you, by the way, not for me, but for my nine year old. Oh, <laughs> yes. Uh, aside, I wish they would add the word please at the end of, it, of Alexa. Yes, that would be nice, wouldn't it? Uh, you know, Alexa, turn on the lights, please. Yes. Otherwise, it won't work. You know, diff <laughs> different, different, different conversations. Tell, tell uh, Jeff Bezos that yeah. next time you talk please. to him. Please. Uh, tell Jeff to, to Bezos, please. Yeah. Yes. So, um, by the way, have you ever talked to the Amazon? Because you talk about them all the time as an example of like a company and blah, 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 and lots of the talks you do. Did you ever do any kind of like speaking thing with them or learn? I haven't. Oh. Yeah. Or with Jeff Bezos, I'm going to write that down. Okay. Email Jeff. Yeah, I'm going to. Um, so I, you know, I, I think it's, you know, it's, we're all products of our childhood, you know, we're in our all, environment and our environments. We're all molded by the experiences we have and the experiences around us when we're younger and they affect our worldview. And I think if you grew up in a world of instant gratification of get, 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 you know, um, th there's very little waiting for things, even grades, you don't wait for grades. You find them out, you take a test, you find out the grade immediately. Right. You know, the, you, know you take a standardized test, you can log on and get the, the grades when you're done with the test. Absolutely. Um, I, I'm not, I want to interject though. What I'm thinking more about is the fact that people's work ethic isn't 
high anymore. Like they want the instant gratification, but also there, there's a laziness that's instilled yeah. because yeah. I think because everything comes so easy, the swiping to find a date to, or, you know, Amazon to like, you know, when you want to buy something, but there's also this like other like layer of just, you know, work life balance and this and that. And like, I know you're all about balance. So this is going to be kind of hard for me to kind of explain, to talk to you about, but like, is there such a thing when you're, when you're really trying to like build, you know, like habits and hustle, when you're, when you're like, you're trying to build your career at the beginning and really want to strive and be successful. Isn't there an imbalance just naturally? Of course. Right. Of course. Okay. But it's, it's, balance is the wrong balances doesn't mean even. Oh, okay. Right. Um, uh, you know, it's not about equal, it's about equitable. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right? Like great relationships aren't equal, they're equitable, mm -hmm. right? An equal relationship is I cook, you cook. I clean, you clean. I do the dishes, you do the dishes. That's, you know, that's an that's equal true. relationship. An equitable relationship is I'll cook, you do the dishes. I'll put the kids to bed, you take out the garbage. That's an equitable relationship, right? We're not doing the same things, it's not equal, but it feels balanced. Right. But everybody's okay with the distribution of labor. Right, and we have to remember that there's nothing for free. Not a, there's nothing in this world that comes for free, and everything that you get comes at a cost, always. And the only question is, is the cost worth it? Right. And so, if you want to achieve, like there's a lot of people who've done extremely well, and the question is, at what cost? What we're talking about is, is the desire to have without paying for it. Mm -hmm. You know, which is I want this, but I'm not willing to pay the cost, right? So for example, working really hard to get something, I want to achieve this. The cost is I'm going to have a couple of sleepless nights. Mm -hmm. I'm going to work a little harder. I'm going to miss out on some social events. I might be a little bit exhausted now and then, but for me, that's worth the cost because of what I'm trying to accomplish. And so I think what we're seeing is a, is a, is a, is a misunderstanding of the, of the cost to benefit uh, uh, equation. And, and by the way, it's not for us to say whether the cost that was worth it to us is worth it to other people. Right. It may not be, right? And that's not for us to decide. I think where, where we do get to interject is if you wanna have mm -hmm. something like what we've done, but you aren't willing to pay any cost and make any sacrifice, that's a complicated scenario, mm -hmm. right? Um, because ain't nothing for free. Hundred percent. I'm so happy that you said that because that is a hundred percent, in my opinion, completely accurate. You but it's not for us to determine what someone's ambitions should be either. Like if somebody is totally fine, right? You know, here, right? And whatever here is defined as, I mean, it doesn't matter. It could be financial. It could be, it could be anything. Whatever it is, right? If somebody's fine here, and and they don't work a lot of hours right. and this that's is fine. and for them this is very happy i think that's fantastic right i'm not telling anybody they have to live my way your way their way this way that way i don't want to live one way either like i don't need max 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 whatever other people have because i don't want to work to that degree either like i accept that there's some degree of things that I can achieve because I'm just not willing to do the work. Absolutely. I'm okay with that. And you're okay, but you already are self-aware enough to know that about yourself. Well, it's eyes wide open. It's eyes wide open. But I think it's, I think what you're saying is basically what I'm saying is that there's a, there is a cost. You can't have it all. If you want this, sometimes like when people say, oh, you know, you can have this work, you, you can be a, like for a woman, you could be a CEO and be a powerhouse, but also have like three kids and be a wonderful mom and then be an amazing wife. Like something always has to give. So yeah. like, to me, that's like just being honest and being real. A, a friend of mine who was a senior executive at a, a big company, yeah. a mom, you know, she had kids. She told me very early on when I was, uh, she was like my work mom, like I was entry level and she took me under her wing. She was a partner at the company. And I remember, I don't remember how the conversation came up, but she, I remember her telling me, she goes, any woman who decides uh, to be, a, to, to want a career and to be a mother, to be a working mother, has to get used to the idea that you're always gonna disappoint someone. Mm -hmm. You just have to get used to it. You're either gonna disappoint your company because you wanna stay home with your kids, or you're gonna disappoint your kids because you wanna work late. Yep. Like you just have to get comfortable with the fact that you're always going to disappoint someone or sometimes you disappoint yourself. Right. You know, like 
Absolutely. But these, but the point is, is what she was, there was another way of saying, there's a cost for the choices I've made. And by the way, you can always change those choices too. Right. Like that's also on the table. Like none of these things are, are you know, one and done. Right. Etched in stone. Etched in stone. Right. And I think that's one of the things that COVID did for a lot of us, which is we went back and reevaluated some of the choices we made and thought, ooh, I can recalibrate, you know? And I think that's kind of what we're going through right now, which is this weird period of sort of like, sort of nobody's really exactly sure how the working world is going to net out. That's and I happening. think, I think there's a massive recalibration happening, you know, some of which shows up as, you know, debate over, do we come back to work? Do we not come back to work? Is it hybrid? What does that even look like? How does that even work? What does hybrid look like? What are the rules of hybrid? What do you think you know? of hybrid? What do you think of all these rules? Like you're, I mean, you, you go into companies talking about this all the time, right? Yeah, so. It is causing a lot of stress for a lot of companies. I mean, it's, you know, and I, and I get asked the question all the time, which is, what are we supposed to do? And the answer is, I have no clue. You know, <laughs> the, you know the, the only thing I know, I, th I think we can say for certain, is that flexibility is here to stay. Yeah. Where it used to be, can I, you know, you ask permission to work from home next Friday, because my kids are going to be home from school. And now you can just email in the morning, say I'm working from home today and everybody's fine with it. I think that's here to stay. But, but the exact balance, I don't think every, anybody got it figured out yet. And how you enforce the balance, I don't think anybody's figured out yet. And I don't think the right balance is going to suit every company either. Like, right. you know, I think it's going to be different, especially if you have people that have to come to work, you're in manufacturing or retail or something, and people who don't have to come to work because they're still accounting and back office in those companies. Yeah. Does it create a divided system of haves and have nots? You know, people who have yeah. agency and people who don't. That's not healthy for a culture either. So... I don't think we know yet, and I think it's a bit of chaos right now, combined with the fact that many of us are, you know, sort of going through our own recalibrations, going, what kind of life do I want? Um, yeah. So I think it's a bit of a mess, but it's okay. It'll, it'll, it'll organize. I, th I think chaos is great because chaos is an opportunity for creativity, right? Because without chaos, you have to break something to change something. Right. Now you don't have to break it. You can just change it. So but I when think it's people a great are, opportunity. You think so? Because yeah. I think that you get to reinvent work. We get to reinvert, reinvent reinvent what work what work is. True, but they, what ha what happens if everybody's there's like so much there's so much flex the pendulum has swung so far. What happened to collaboration and Yeah, it'll all suffer. This yes. is what happens. And You're, socialize again, yes. back to the socialization of piece. Of people course. are becoming like automata like what, what do they call automaton? It? Yes, automatons. Robots. Yes. Because everything is like a screen or this, like we now don't even know like what people even really look like in real life. We anymore. don't. We definitely don't know how tall they are. Yeah, um, <laughs> definitely don't know the, that. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> nice, ni nice. Uh, what do you call it? We we had somebody on our team that w was hired during COVID, and I'd never met her until you know a year into working with us. Right. And when I met her, she's six one. I was like, what the. <laughs> Like, I had no idea. Like, we're always the same height when I look at you on the screen. Exactly. You know? So, um, so you're right. The pendulum did swing the other way, but that's what happens. Yes. It's a reaction. There's a cost for that reaction and it'll come back. That's why I say it's a sort of a chaotic time. Um, okay. uh, uh, but I think that, um, you know, we can whine about it or we can say, okay, how do we sort of, how can we have some say of, wh of what it could be? And let's have those conversations out loud. Let's talk about the costs. Let's talk about the advantages and disadvantages. Like, yes, it's great to have flexibility to work from whatever you want, but um, it does damage collaboration and brainstorming. Like creativity is gonna go down because everybody's so excessively polite on Zoom and mm -hmm. they mute themselves when they're not speaking. And if you've ever had a brainstorming meeting, Ugh. that's not how it is. It's messy and noisy and you interrupt each other and nobody's offended when you interrupt each other. And you're like, oh, I have an idea. And it's, and that's what produces great brainstorming. Totally. So, you know, I've started when I have, it doesn't work with big meetings, but I've started doing it with small meetings where I make everybody keep their microphones uh, on. on. And I encourage just speaking out like it's a real meeting, you know, which yeah. it does help. Um, it does help. Um, but not the same as being in person. Does not, is, of course not. You and I talking over a Zoom would not feel exactly like this. You can't create human connection when there's a screen in front of you. But I think we you. all know that. Like that's not that's not the news. I think the news is, well, okay, what are we gonna do? Right. And you know, some people are saying, well, I don't care about that because I value my freedom and I value my this and I value my where I want to live. And, you know, it's sort of like I think the if anything, you know, there's sort of a 
a weird selfishness to it all, mm -hmm. you know? And it goes back to what we're saying, which is I want, I want everything. I want my cake and I want to eat it and I want everything and everything's going to go my way. And, you know, having it my way is a very noble aspiration, just unrealistic. Right. You know, it's like you have kids, you love to get all your sleep. You know, it's like, it's not how it works. Right. And it goes back to what we were just saying a minute ago, which is there's a cost for everything. And, uh, um, but that's okay. I think, I think, I think those lessons will be learned. You know, I said some, some things ago, uh, I said things on, a, on another podcast recently that when I read the comments, like people were like lashing out, which I thought was so fascinating. What did you say? So I basically talked about how, um, this young, it skews younger. It's not completely, but it skews younger have become very comfortable quitting. It's become, uh, normalized, mm -hmm. um, where, um, when you and I were younger, you, whether, even if you didn't like your job, you had to stay for at least a year because otherwise you'd destroy your resume. To totally. Right? You had, it just, it was, it is what it is. Like you, right. you just had to suck it up for a year. Right? By the way, I saw you talk about that on something and I was, to that's one of the things I yeah. was like, oh my God, exactly. That's so true. So, so I, and this is what I talked about. And I talked about how, where quitting has become so uh, normalized that there's a lot of people, excuse younger, um, who quit very quickly. You know, after three months or four months, you, maybe they like, they're having a bad week or they, they're, they're um, confrontation avoidant and don't want to ask for a raise. So it's just easier to quit. Or maybe they got in trouble and they're like, you know, fuck my boss. And like, I'm going to quit. And, okay. You know? And so, you know, what ends up happening is flash forward five years, there's going to be a portion of the, of the workforce that over the course of five years has had nine or 10 jobs. Mm -hmm. And any employer is going to look at a resume and be like, yeah, no, I'm not going to take the, uh, you're so smart, you're brilliant, but I can't take the risk, mm -hmm. you know, or they have been in the workforce for five years, but they've only really had about seven months of work experience because right. they keep starting again and they know what it's like to work in calm waters, but they have yet to really sit through and weather a storm, you know, uh, because going through, going through a hard time, whether you're having a hard time at work or whether the company's having a hard time, like you learn skills in that, that are valuable to companies. And by the way, they're valuable to you. Right. And so, and I said these things and I couldn't believe the backlash, you know, in the comments. Like what? Well, you know, you know, that I was speaking from the point of an employer and you know, uh, that that's about exploitation. And I'm like, I, I, you know, I'm not, and I think there's a, a sort of a, a, a misunderstanding um, and a quick to judge. Like I, I have no judgment in what I'm saying. It's, it's an observation. It's an observation that, that younger people generally are more comfortable quitting more quickly. Right. And if we go back to, again, this is going to be our recurring theme. What's the cost of that? Yes. You're like, yes, it has benefits. Absolutely. Why should you put up with a, a job you don't like? Get out of there. Sure. Absolutely. You know, Yes, you, you know, your, 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 your boss is not the world's most fantastic leader, not a bad person, but not a great leader. Sure, get out of there. You know, yeah, I have, it sounds great, but there's a cost. And I'm not sure those costs are being weighed, right. but there will be an accounting in five years. And that's all I'm saying, which is just be aware. Just go in with eyes wide open. Think of the long game. You can still make the decision. You can still make the decision. I'm not saying make or don't make the decision. Right. I'm saying I'm saying be cognizant of the long game. You know? And people people I see to me that is so absurd. That's how you build like do hard things is how you build resilience and and mental toughness. And, and I'm not asking anybody to, and you're like, not, and I know to this endure is not, toxicity, you know? Of course not. I, I, but, I, 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 I do, but don't you, don't you do things like, do you think I want to work out every single day and like grind on that out? No, but if I want the, if I see the results that I get at the end of the day or the end of the year or whatever we're saying, you put up with the stuff that you don't want to do for the long-term gain of what you can get. That, that there is an equation. Right. Right. Um, and as I said, I think that when we, th when we think of equations, we think of the short-term benefit. Yes. And we, that's fine. There's always short-term benefits and, and liabilities. There's no problem with that. But we also have to consider the long-term benefits and liabilities, especially it's in, 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 if we consider relationships or careers or, you know, life. You know, these things are not, they're not 
um, they're not finite games. Right. Um, Which is, they keep going and, and to think about them as, as, as um, sort of these, uh, I don't know what the word is, these unique experiences that don't exist in any context. Is, so you mean is, like, uh, uh, I, I, there's a word for it. I can't okay. remember what it is, but it, but um, when you think of these events as discrete packets that have no consequences before or after that, there's no context. Right. I think it's just blind. I mean, of course there's context, there's context for everything. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah. But what's the, like you, I think I saw something you're talking about, like, was it like self actualization versus shared actualization? Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Because we're living in a time, everyone wants to be self actualized. Yeah. And we're saying that people now it's like a very selfish me, me oriented world. Right. Yeah. What did you mean by shared? Like, yeah. can you explain that a little bit? Yeah. I mean, I think that especially the United States over indexed on the concept of rugged individualism mm -hmm. and you can see it play out in how we, you know, what our guidance counselors tell us, what our bosses tell us, you know, the incentive structures in our and reward systems in our universities and in our businesses, which is, it's all individual performance. Right. Um, and we pay little to no consideration to teamwork or did you serve the team or did you serve yourself? Um, and that has cost, you know, right. to the team. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, it basically goes to uh, um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, yeah. which is where the, the self-actualization uh, came from. Um, that's, not, that's the top of his. So, so yeah, I, I think Maslow was wrong, right? So Maslow hierarchy of needs, the base of the pyramid is food and shelter. You know, that you need that first. And the third rung up is human relationships. And at the top of the pyramid of pyramid is self-actualization. So you're supposed to work your way up the hierarchy of needs until you can get to self-actualization. And what Maslow's mistake is, is that he only thinks of us as individuals, but what he fails to consider is that we're also simultaneously members of groups. Every single one of us, every single day lives in paradox. You know, we are individuals. I want my own identity. I want my own individuality. I want to self-express all of those things, all true. And simultaneously, I'm a member of a family, I'm a member of a church, I'm a member of a team. I'm a member of a company, I'm a member of a, you know, a, a synagogue, a synagogue, whatever, yeah. you know, like I have membership, you know, and I have responsibility as a, in the group. Right. And there's a debate. Do I put myself first at the sacrifice of the group or do I put the group first at the sacrifice of myself? And there's a, and, and some will say there's a whole school of thought that says you always prioritize yourself um, because if you don't help yourself, you can't help right. others. And they always give the same stupid analogy, which is when you're in a plane, you put your mask on before you can help somebody else. That's a crashing plane, not a good analogy, right? That's a crashing plane with no, with, with no air in it. Right. Correct. You have to put yourself first. Correct. Right. That's not a good analogy for life. Right. Um, but then there's a school of thought that says, no, you have to help others always first. Otherwise the group will never be there to help you, but that's martyrdom. And sometimes you get to it to a point where you actually do destroy yourself because you're trying so hard to help everybody else, put everybody else first. Right. The answer is both. It's a paradox. It's complicated. And so where Maslow got it wrong is he failed to consider us as members of groups, which is why he put food and shelter first, which is true as an individual, but I've never heard of anybody dying by suicide because they were hungry. Right. You die by suicide because you're lonely, which is the third thing up, but it seems more important than food. Right. And so how selfish is it that we work to self-actualization and we metaphorically literally sit on top, well, not literally and metaphorically, but metaphorically sit on top of a pyramid looking down at all the unself-actualized people. How selfish that we live a life so that we can get to the top of a pyramid as opposed to shared actualization. Like how do we take as many people with us to find joy, love, fulfillment, safety, Come, let's go on that journey together to the top of the pyramid. Is that not my responsibility as a member of, of, the, of the group, you know, to take as many people with me as possible, to look out for them, you know, to take care of the weak ones and not let the, the strong ones get too ahead of themselves because we're a part of a team. Oh, by the way, the thing that I'm describing is called leadership. Mm -hmm. But isn't that what we're supposed to be doing? You know, we have an entire section in the bookshop called self-help and we have no section in the bookshop called help others. And we have entire industries that are literally telling us how we can find happiness, how we can find love, how we can find the perfect job. And yet no one is teaching us how we can help our friends find love and how we can help our friends find the job of their dreams and how we can help our friends find happiness. And that is a skill set equal to the skill set of helping oneself. They have 
they both have value. I'm not rejection. I'm not rejecting taking care of oneself, but I'm telling you that there's also a, another part of this equation. And I think that we've we've overdone this one, and you see it reflected now. You know, uh, even even the way we've commercialized and made we, we've miraculously made things like meditation and yoga selfish, right? How can I I I, I love it? I feel I feel so I feel so present, right? It's like I, I feel present now. Yes. There are absolutely benefits to meditation. We know the benefits of taking care of oneself and finding that mindfulness, right? Um, uh, we know all those, those, those social and medical benefits. But the reason we practice meditation, we think about it in meditation, meditation is you sit still, you focus on one thing, whether it's a mantra or your breath or whatever it is, and you put everything else out of your mind. And if you have a thought, you label it a thought and you say, I'll deal with that later and you find this incredible calm and peacefulness that comes. The reason we call it a practice is so you can practice it for others, not just for yourself. Yes, we know the benefits to you. Have you ever taken that practice and given it to others? So when they're sitting there telling you their problems, that you're not just thinking of the thing that you wanna say next, you're not just thinking how do you can fix their problems, or they tell you about their great day and you interrupt them and tell them about your great day, but rather because you've been practicing this mindfulness that you can sit completely quietly focused on one thing and one thing only is what they're telling you. And if something goes bang over there, you actually don't turn your head because you're so focused and you have a thought and you label it a thought and you put it out of your mind and say, I'll deal with it later because right now I'm focused on the person I'm with. And at the end of that interaction, you will know you were present when they tell you you were. We are not present until someone tells us we are present. And they will say things like, thank you for listening. They will say things like, I feel heard. They will say, Thank you for being present with me, holding space for me. Congratulations, all that hard work you've been doing meditating was now also for the benefit of another. And what we also know is that the medical science on this, for all the benefits of mindfulness for oneself are multiplied by 10 when you do it for someone else. By 10? Service. Omar Service. Brownson talks yes. about this. Um, he, has a, he, he, he specializes in gratitude. Right, yes. And, and he talks about the difference. The way he labels it is mindfulness versus uh, heartfulness, you know? And, and he and I talked about how mindfulness is about me and I'm in my head, but heartfulness is about someone else, right? And, and he has the data that there's 10x medical benefit to the service of mindfulness rather than the, the taking of mindfulness. It has benefit. And I'm not saying no, you're right. not do this. I'm saying also do this, you know? I, I know the I, I know the study you're talking about. It's actually I, I, it's in my this book that I just wrote, but it's about gra I, I say not service. I say the word uh, gratitude because people think that if they journal the gratitude, like grati they journal uh, that that's having gratitude, but it's actually the act of like telling somebody thank you or mm -hmm. sort of like basically turning it on its head to somebody mm -hmm. else the um, effects are like tenfold, which yeah. is I think the same, is the same and, thing. And, and, and in our fast paced, you know, social media world, I think we've conflated some of these human um, practices mm -hmm. and we've sort of, sort of mixed them up a little bit. You know, I, one of my favorites is people who put these beautiful posts on Instagram with them as babies being held by their dad and, you know, and it says happy birthday dad or happy, Father's Day, Daddy. Your dad's not on Instagram. Like, who are you telling? <laughs> like, who are you? It's like, who? Are you, like, your dad. What? Did you call your dad? Like, totally. like, happy. You're the best sister. Happy siblings' day. Did you? Did you call your sibling? You know, I, I find that funny. Um, I find it so phony and bullshit. Is what I, I mean, call it. And and or or that we talk about vulnerability when you know you talk about your breakup or the hard thing you're going through. And you're sitting by yourself in your room talking to your phone. By the way, that may not be the first take. It might be the fourth take that I'm doing this because it was sort of the lighting was bad. Um, and I put that on TikTok. Preach, preach, preach. I put that on TikTok and I say, I, vulnerability for everyone to learn from. That's not vulnerability, that's broadcasting. Now go say those exact words to a person, which is way more difficult. And I think for us to practice true vulnerability, which is to sit with somebody, whether in pain or joy, which is to sit across from them or to the very minimum pick up the telephone versus a text and say, I just want you to know I love you and I care about you and you are one of my best friends. 
and I will be there for you in thick and thin no matter what. And I know that you would be there for me. And I just want you to know how grateful I am for this friendship and for you, right? Do yes. that to somebody or sit in pain with them and saying, I'm struggling. You and I have had a fight and I'm up every night because of it. It hurts me. And I don't know where it came from. The words you said to me the other day hurt me like a knife, right? Go say that to the person as opposed to broadcasting it. Because that doesn't actually, it gives you a, a salve. It makes you feel a little bit better for the few minutes you've done it. Does it? Or is it more for the other people on social media? I, it has to have some benefit to, get a to like oneself. or a follow. I mean, that would be really cynical of us to say. But uh, I, I, I have to believe it has some You're benefit. You're the optimist. I never said I was. Fair. Um, I'm still cynical though. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. The, yeah. you know, there, of course, there's some benefit, but the problem is it's a short term benefit. Whereas, you know, you and I both know that to get in the shit with someone professionally, personally, to get in the shit with someone, almost always you come out with clarity, better understanding, and usually a much better relationship. Totally. Almost always. You know, struggle is some of the best thing that can happen in a relationship. Um, uh, shared hardship actually releases oxytocin in our bodies. You know, everybody's all about dopamine and oxytocin. And oxytocin comes from many, many reasons. Some healthy, some not healthy. But one of the healthy ways that we get oxytocin is shared hardship. You know, have somebody go take some Marines and put them in combat together. Mm -hmm. Those Marines will come back in love with each other. They will love each other. It's shared experience. Shared hardship yeah. in particular. And you shared know, hardship. Yeah. shared hardship, shared struggle actually create strong bonds. You know, if there's a hurricane that comes through, all mm -hmm. of a sudden who you voted for doesn't matter at all. Mm -hmm. I got you, right? I got you. I totally agree. I mean, do you spend, I mean, how much time do you spend on social media? You have a lot of followers and all that other jazz. Are you constantly looking at your phone? Are you constantly doing all that stuff? Like what's your ratio? Well, I mean, I have all my notifications turned off on my telephone, except for texts and phone calls. Um, I get zero notifications if I got an email. I get zero notifications if anybody posted or liked or anything on any social media ever, right? So I don't have that dopamine, you know, ding, ding, ding. I don't right. have it. Um, uh, but like anyone, you know, I can go down a rabbit hole if I'm feeling a little bit down or lonely. Of course I go swipe, you know, swiping for, for goodness. And my goodness, the algorithm on TikTok, oh my. you know, I'll just spend 10 minutes and two hours later, you know, I tell me, but that, that, that to me is there's like, some funny, talented, entertaining people out there. Amazing. And they're brilliant and wonderful. And that algorithm is astonishing. Uh, it is astonishing. It is astonishing. Yeah. It is astonishing how good it is and how it just feeds me everything I want to see better than anything else. But I'm also fully aware, like, I can't do it that often. Like, I know that if I open that TikTok app, I am fully aware that I am not in control of myself. 100. I am, I am fully aware that time will evaporate. And, and I know that I'm going to like, like, I'm going to like sit in bed and like, then all of a sudden I'm, I'm going to stop because I'm falling asleep and I realize it's one o'clock in the morning. Totally. So I know not to turn the app on, but, but it's, I would say that my social media interaction is mostly healthy only because I have all the notifications turned off. So right. I don't even know, I don't even, I don't even the buttons, the count of how many emails you have. I, I have none on the little envelope on my phone. Gosh, you're like, yeah, that's it's so blank. Good. Not because I don't have emails. It's because I only find out. If I'm like, oh, I think I'll check my email now, open up the email app and I see all the new emails. Oh, good. So I don't, I don't have notifications turned on. on so you basically controlled your environment that way. So you know that you have a, ch that's, you're taking away the ability to kind of go yeah. down those things. And my phone is always, my, the ringer is always turned off. It doesn't even vibrate. So I literally don't know if anything's coming in unless I pick it up to look. So I don't have that, that dopamine thing. Um, I make a practice of when I'm out with friends that I put my phone on a, on a different seat. I put it out of, I don't put it on a table. I put it out of reach. I can't see it uh, on purpose. On purpose. On purpose, because I understand the addictive qualities of the device. And so, you know, it's like the first thing you do with an alcoholic is you take all the alcohol out of the house because right. we just don't have that kind of willpower. It's not because they're weak. It's because none of us have that kind of willpower to resist. And so to think that we're so strong that we can resist the dopamine powers of, of our cell phones and social media is just wrong. Right. You know, so so I, I I put it out of sight.
That's a good idea. I or, mean, or sometimes give it to my friend. Like, Can you carry my phone for me? That's Do a, that a lot. That's a great idea. Just because it's like, because I, because we're living in that kind of world now, which is, that's why I don't know how we, you, you know, you, we, we always find like, you know, the pendulum swings, but because we're getting more and more addicted because there's more platforms, like every day there's a new platform that comes up yeah. and a new thing that happens. Where do we come back to a place where we're like, kind of like we're, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, we didn't have this type of like same addiction where there wasn't social media. Well, I mean, there were other things to get addicted to. <laughs> what were we addicted to? Alcohol. Uh, tr people are still, uh, people are still doing that. The fentanyl true. is being sold right now. It's like, true. It's, like it's true. I'm just saying it's not like, like, it's not like the world was so, you know, <laughs> let's not be Pollyannish that the world was perfect <laughs> and nobody had any addictions. <laughs> no, no, no. no but, but, you're, but you're right. I mean, um, the amount of, uh, I think, is it, I can't remember the statistic I just read recently. Is it deaths by alcohol or just, we all know the amount of drinking that went up during COVID skyrocketed. Oh. But I think deaths by alcohol have also gone up. Did yours? Like, what did you? What did did you, I die from alcohol? No, 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 no. And when, when, from COVID, how did, did you tweak or modify your habits or your, your life at all? Like, at all? Or I don't know how to answer that question because I think all of our lives were tweaked, tweaked and modified. No, no, no. For, but at, like now that we've kind of come out the other end or other other way. Oh, oh, has anything remained? Yeah. Like, oh. what have you done? Like, what have you, have you, like, did you kind of increase your fitness level? Did you stop working as much? Like what's your, I want to know what you do every single day. I want to know what time you wake up, how you wake up, what you eat, what you don't eat. So one of the magical things that happened during COVID was um, my niece and nephew were little kids that I saw two or three times a month. Mm. And then I went to having family dinner with them every single night, you know? And so my sister's family and I, we sort of, we were back and forth between our two homes. And we had family dinner every single night. Every family yeah, had family yeah, yeah, dinner yeah, yeah. every single night. Oh, you mean during COVID you did yeah, that? During yeah, during COVID. Mm -hmm. And so I loved it. Aww. And um, and we have tried as a family to preserve uh, that as much as possible. Where we have Friday night sushi night, for example. As you know, there's occasional exceptions where you know they have a game or I'm traveling, but for the most part, that that Friday night sushi night is sacred. I won't make plans because I got to have dinner with the kids. And, uh, and I really like it. I really like it. Um, so I've tried to cling on to some of those things. Um, I've, you know, it goes, it, I, I have, it waxes and wanes. Um, but, uh, I've tried to maintain a, a better balance of, uh, of travel, you know, being away because family has become more important. I mean, it's always been important, but being present for family. Mm -hmm. Um, when you say family, your sister, your kid, my niece and nephew, nephew yeah. yeah, niece my and nephew. nephew yeah. uh, okay, I got to ask you a bunch of like leadership questions because that's I have a bunch. Um, what are the two most powerful success habits people should cultivate in order to go get, get ahead in life? Um, uh, good question. Uh, number one is curiosity. Um, the 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 very difficult thing of replacing judgment with curiosity uh, makes for good leadership. Um, curiosity also leads to humility. The best ne definition of humility I ever heard was a, from a guy named Bob Gaylor who said, don't confuse humility for meekness. He mm -hmm. said, he says, humility is being open to the ideas of others. Um, you can have a big ego, but you can still be like, all right, let's hear your idea. You know, as opposed to just shooting the idea down. Right. Um, you don't have to agree with it but you can be curious about it. So I think replacing, learning to replace curiosity, uh, re judgment with curiosity and, and practicing curiosity makes you hum keeps you humble. You don't have all the best ideas, for example, other people are smart too. Right. Um, I think is one. And the other one is the equally difficult practice to learn to say, I don't know, or I need help. Um, I think are absolutely essential. Do you, you said, I, I mean, you talk about this a lot, about empathy, mm -hmm. power of empathy, and that's like a key component for leadership. Yeah. And that, you, that you've noticed that most powerful leaders have this. Well, the good ones. The good ones. The good ones. There's a lot of powerful I, leaders. I was going to say, was gonna yeah. say that word was not the right word. It's mostly the good ones. Can you teach empathy or can someone learn to be more empathetic? Sure, sure, sure. Absolutely. 100%. Um, uh, it is a practice. It is a skill. Uh, like so many others. Um, right. I think empathy again starts with curiosity. Yeah. You know, um, you know, if somebody's underperforming instead of lab labeling them stupid or lazy or unmotivated or snowflakes to ask the question, I wonder what's going on in their life. I hope they're okay. That's empathy. And then to actually say to them, 
are you okay? You know, um, negative narratives are, you know, they're dangerous at every level of a company. You know, sometimes, right. you know, um, you know, uh, rank and file will start a narrative about leadership. They're assholes. They don't care. And sometimes leadership starts a narrative about an employee. They're stupid. They're lazy. And the problems that'll affect how we treat each other. And we'll start looking for evidence to va validate our, our narratives. Yeah. It's very easy to interrupt. You simply say, I wonder what else it could be, you know, and, and it's important for, you know, if you're with a team and you start shitting on leadership, somebody could say, I wonder what else it could be. You know, maybe they're under stress or maybe they, maybe they, we don't know what's going on, you know, and same thing with leadership, which is one of, in a group that somebody starts labeling somebody, or even if you're doing it by yourself, you say, I wonder what else it could be. I wonder what else is going on in their life. And you can make a list. So, so, you know, you know, they're lazy. That, that's still on the list. You know, that could be it. Sure. Okay. Or maybe there's something going on in their personal life that we don't know about. Maybe there's some family drama that they're dealing with that we don't know about. Maybe we've given them too much um, uh, um, work. Maybe they're overworked and burnt out. Maybe maybe we've we've un maybe they're undertrained. They don't know what they're doing, and we've we have a culture where it's too difficult to ask for help. Like it could be fifty things. You know, it could still be the one that you think, but it could be other things too. And the point is, is, is now when you talk to that person, you're operating with empathy. You're operating with curiosity, you know? Um, so yeah, of course it's practicable. Yeah. It's pra and I, learnable. Yeah. And you get better at it. Like anything you do it more, it becomes second nature. Right. You know? But I feel when people are uh, like leading, you, I think you talk about this too. Like there are people who are leaders and people who lead. And there's a big difference between the two. Right. Um, can someone learn to be a good, like a, a good leader? Because I feel like, look at, you talk about, um, let's talk about Elon Musk, for example, right? He's like a very powerful man, obviously. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wouldn't think he would be considered a good, a great leader, but everybody does want to work with him and be there and be around mm -hmm. people. People like to be around successful people. That's like human nature. So then how is it that when I think you talk a lot about, um, if you have a why, obviously mm -hmm. that's your whole thing. Mm -hmm. People, that's when people work harder. When they 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 want to, that's when an organization does exceptionally well. Mm -hmm. Do you think that SpaceX or even Amazon or any of these people, like that? I can't imagine those leaders having that type of. I guess they do have the vision, but they're not exactly necessarily great leaders. I guess there is a well. Just answering I mean, my own question. Yeah, I mean, well, we can talk about. Um, you know, leadership has nothing to do with personality. Yeah. Steve Jobs, not the nicest guy in the world. Right. Um, but you talk to people who worked there during the Steve Jobs days that he pushed them to do the best work of their lives. Right. You know, you know, people would show up with their fancy resumes of wherever else they worked and be like, well, I built this and I invented that. And, you know, they would say the same thing, which is we don't care what you've done. We care what you're going to do. Right. You know, and so for people who like to be pushed to do better work, they loved working there. Right. You know, it's, it's not, it's not, it goes back to, you know, no, we, do we share the same beliefs, which is it's it, that culture is not for yeah. everyone. And, and he, by the way, Steve jobs invented a total of zero of the products that Apple made. He came up with it's none true. of them. Right. The ideas for those products came from within the teams. So, so he's not the genius because he came up with all the ideas. He, he was the genius because he pushed people to come up with ideas and, and, and he knew how to contextualize them and share them with the world. Right. Um, um, he understood that that he understood what good looked like. So was he a, the nicest guy in the world? No. Was he a great leader? Yeah. I mean, for heaven's sakes, after a multi-billionaire died who flies in private jets everywhere he goes, you know, like he cannot relate to our lives. We cannot relate to his life. After he died, people laid flowers at a retail store to mourn the loss of a CEO. Like, just think about that for just Crazy, one minute. Crazy, I know. Right? And that can only happen if someone gives us something to believe in. If somebody gave us something to feel a part of, whether you're an employer or a customer, you know, or a spectator. Right. So so the evidence is demonstrated by the fact that he, he, he gave people something to stand for, right? Yeah. Um, or, or to belong to. Um, what very often happens to a lot of leaders is um, sometimes they start to believe their own press. They start to believe that because they've had a string of success that everything they do will be successful. Um, it was described to me recently by a friend that you have a bag of balls, you know, of equal number of red, uh, red balls and blue balls. Um, I'll change that one. Let's go with, let's go with red balls and green balls. 
Okay. Um, <laughs> You, you have a, I love it. You have a dirty mind. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so Red Bulls and Green Bulls. I love balls. it. Very, we'll, we'll stay Christmas oriented. Uh, uh, Red Bulls and Green Bulls. And yes. you know, you put your hand in and you pull out a Red Bull and you pull your hand in and you pull out a Red Bull and you pull out your hand and you, and you put that ed, eight Red Bulls in a row. Okay. And you're just like, I'm a freaking star. I'm like the Red Bull pro. Except the opportunity for failure, the, the opportunity for pulling at the other cup now have gone up. The odds, because it's equal number, right? Yeah. And so that's kind of life, which is these 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 folks who had you know massive success. They keep pulling. What they're reckon, what they're failing to recognize is failure could be the next could be the next pull. You know. Absolutely. And um, and unfortunately, the good ones surround themselves with teams of rivals, people who disagree with them. And the ones who start to believe they're in hype and have gone off the deep end surround themselves with people who only agree with them, uh, uh, or only people who agree with them, um, validating their genius every day. And uh, that, that, that doesn't work well for the long term. It doesn't work well. You Actually, you said the word rival, not in the same way, but in your, I guess this was written a few years ago, The Infinite Game, but you do talk about worthy rivals. Well, who is your worthy rival? I mean, I have a bunch, you know, uh, uh, worthy rivals. So let's define what a worthy rival is first. Yes. Um, I know the story you want me to tell. Um, uh, so there is another author who does what I do. He writes books, he gives talks, he's extremely smart. And, uh, you know, I hate him. <laughs> Would you um, say that? You know, my, my hatred for him is completely irrational. I'm aware of that. Um, he's always been very civil to me when I've seen him at events and very kind. Um, he never done anything to hurt me that I know of. He's a good guy. I just have a rational hatred. And as a result of my contempt, I'm very, very, very competitive with him. So I will regularly go on Amazon and look at his book ranking. And then I'll immediately look at my book ranking. And if he's ahead, I'm angry. And if I'm ahead, I'm smug. Um, mind you, I check no one else's rankings. It's like, it's like as if there's only two people writing books. I check no one else's rankings, just his. Right? Right. I'm competitive with him. Um, we had the opportunity to speak at the same event. And I don't mean like me in the morning, him in the afternoon. I mean like we were going to be on the stage at the same time, interviewed by, we're going to be interviewed. And the interviewer thought it would be fun if uh, we introduced each other. And I went first. And I turned to him and I said, um, you make me really insecure. All of your strengths are all of my weaknesses. And whenever your name comes up, I get really uncomfortable. And he turned to me and he said, funny, I feel the same about you. The reason I was so competitive with him and the reason I had this irrational contempt had nothing to do with him. It had to do with me. Because his strengths show me my weaknesses, it's too difficult to look at myself and say that I'm weak here. And it's much easier to say I hate him and I'm going to beat him, right? Now, the funny thing is after that experience, there was a total catharsis. All of that negativity, all of that competitive spirit completely went away. And he and I are now friends and regularly, you know, promote each other and help each other. Um, Just hang out together? We live in different cities, but yeah, if we're in the same place, we'll definitely hang out together. Um, 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 and, I, and, I, and this is what worthy rivals are. Worthy rivals are other players in the game whose strengths reveal to your weaknesses. And instead of trying to compete against them because you can't beat them, there's no such thing as winning in this game. Like, what, what am I, there's like, what, I sell more books, am I the winner? You know, no, right. it means nothing. I pick an arbitrary thing. What if it's social media following? Like, it could be anything. What if it's- You're winning anyway. Like, like who knows? Like, yeah. you know, I mean, like the point is it's, it's stupid and arbitrary. Right, it is you know? arbitrary. He, he sure. makes 10 times more money than me. Am I winning or losing? Like, like who the hell knows? What's your metric, right? right. It's, just, it's stupid. The point is the comparisons are stupid, mm -hmm. right? Um, but what is valuable is that when you pick players who are better at one or many things than you are, that because their strengths reveal to your weaknesses, the opportunity is to either work on those weaknesses to get better, to become a better player yourself or to partner with them. Right. Because then those strengths and those weaknesses balance each other off. They, neg uh, they, they, uh, negate each other. Um, and so I'm not competitive. I have no competitors, but I definitely have worthy rivals people who are really good at what they do and I have such love and admiration for them. And I used to get insecure about it, but now I'm grateful because it helps me be a better player. So I'm a great believer in worthy rivals. And the same goes for companies, by the way. You know, for companies to compare each other, themselves to each other and say, we're better. Based on what? Revenues, profit, market share, number of employees? Like based on what? 
like based on what time frame this year total the next 10 years like it's all arbitrary and nonsense right not to mention the fact that most companies are taken down not by the competitor they're obsessed with but the one they didn't know of right you think myspace even had any idea that facebook even existed you know it doesn't happen you think the, the big tv studios and movie studios were paying any attention to netflix exactly you know you, you think the big three car companies were worried about what Tesla was going to do to upset their marketplace. Like nobody's looking at the upstarts. They're looking at each other. So further reinforcing the folly of, of arbitrary competition in, in, in business or in life or, you know, in, in any, in any sort of these infinite games. Um, so yeah, I, I'm a great believer in worthy rivals. We should have them because it makes us better. So does, is this person still your worthy? Since you kind of had this catharsis, do you have some? He was, he was my competitor before. Right. Now he's my worthy now, rival. Now he's your, okay. Now I have absolute respect for him and there are things that he does. I'm like, ugh, I could do better. But there are, I have many. Do you have another, do you have a competitor now that you look at? I have Not no a, competitors. All worthy rivals. I have many worthy rivals who, who sometimes they're better at this one thing or they're better at these two things or they're better at those things. And even when we do something at, at, our, at our company, like when we are going to like, I mean, come up with anything, like, we're going to redo our website. Like okay. it'd be something mundane. We'd be like, okay, who are the worthy rivals? Like who's doing it really well that we want to learn from, you know? So we, yeah. we always say, can somebody worthy rival this? Go find somebody who's doing it better than we are. Right. So we right, can right. learn. We do it all the time. Yes, I, I do think it's a healthy way to kind of keep, keep also keep yourself on your toes in a way without. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, of course. It's like, hel I still call it like healthy competition though. Really why, you know. Problem is it has the word competition. Yeah, you don't like the you word know, competition. It's like if you have a mild melanoma or if you have stage four liver cancer, those things are both called cancer, but they're clearly not the same thing. Absolutely. And so if you use the same word, the problem is it means the same thing. So, you know, so I don't like saying healthy competition because um, because it's not competition. Right, you don't like the word competition. The word competition sets up a false game that this is a finite game of winners and losers. A competitor is someone to beat, right? That's so right. So a competition has a winner and a loser. So let's not use those words because they're actually incorrect. There's no winning business. It doesn't exist. There's no winning healthcare. It doesn't exist. Nobody's declared the winner of career. It doesn't exist. Right. You're ahead or behind, but no one's ever the winner. Right. So what, give me a couple other things that make someone a really strong, good leader besides empathy, curious. Is there anything else that you, that, that people can work on that they can kind of help like people who are listening, who are entrepreneurs, who are now starting to lead a team of some kind. Uh, anything else that you would think that would help people in, a, in that type of new yes. position? Or, or in somebody who's not new to the position. You know, there's a, there's a concept that has been lost in our modern society, and that is, a, that is the concept of honor. We don't talk about honor anymore. Honor is not nothing to do with trustworthiness or reliability or intelligence. It's something very different, right? So an example of honor is, um, um, it's when someone takes advantage of maybe you've had a string of bad luck. Mm -hmm. Let's say you've, you've, uh, let's say, um, you know, you've lost a bunch of clients and it's, you're going through a really hard time and you need all the help that you, 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 you all you, that you can find and somebody on your team comes to you and says, um, I want to renegotiate my contract because somebody gave them some bad advice that you've got all the cards, you've got all the leverage, mm. you should use it. So taking advantage when someone is hurting for self gain is dishonorable. That person may be smart. That person may be very trustworthy. That person may be reliable, but they are not honorable. Honor is about ethics, right? And, too often the standard these days is the law. It's like, I didn't break any laws. Like, you know, a, a, a pharmaceutical company that raises the price of an essential drug a thousand percent, 1500%, yes. it's not illegal. It is not illegal, but it is unethical. It is dishonorable. And I, for one, only want to work with people who have honor, um, who understand that it's, I'd rather lose money in the short term and do the right thing than make money, um, uh, uh, unethically or to put, to be, to act selfishly and take advantage of someone's pain or someone's uh, disadvantage that is dishonorable. And, uh, I choose to build my, my business and be around people who are honorable. And I think we need honor back in business. I think it's gone missing for a while like that. because it's all become so selfishly driven. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so honor is the opposite of selfishness. 
It is. is it, would honor be like integrity too? Would that I think be, honor includes they, integrity. I think you have to have, it's a component of, right? Again, that person may have integrity until they decide to put themselves first. You know, are they out of integrity because they are, because they have all the leverage, quote unquote, you know? So I think, I think I call it honor because it's, that's what it is. It is. So yeah, I think absolutely honor includes integrity. Absolutely. One thing you said, I, I'm sure for everyone always probably says this to you all, that the line about how to motivate people is like, you can either inspire them or you can manipulate them. Is yeah. it like something like that? Yeah. I, there's, I, there's two ways to motivate people. You can manipulate them or you can inspire them. Right. Yeah. Um, manipulation is easy, easier. Um, and, uh, and it's usually more uh, immediate, the impact. And so we tend to rely on it. We see it in business all the time. You know, um, uh, we attempt to uh, coerce people with promotions, right? Mm -hmm. Buy one, get one free. Right. Well, that's a manipulation, right? Oh, I don't really want it, but oh, I'm getting the next one free, you know? Um, we use fear, right? Right. Um, uh, they, uh, your children will die from drinking tap water. Tune in at 11, right? Right. The, if you vote for the other party, crime will go up, you know? Uh, it's like, that's, those are fear based. It's fear based. It works, works really well. Um, even aspirational messages, you know, uh, every, every, every gym membership that has ever been sold is <laughs> look what you could look like, right. you know? Um, and some of them are funny and some of them are, you know, pretty, uh, unethical, but the point is manipulations work. Uh, they work in the short term. They become too expensive and too exhausting over the long term. They actually do not work over the long term. Um, uh, the opposite is inspiration. Um, it's harder, it takes more work. Um, there are sometimes short-term gains, but really you're doing it for long-term. And when you inspire people, you get loyalty, you get trust, you get those kinds of things, which the other manipulations do not build at all. Can you name somebody, a leader that you've seen that does this very well, who you think is a really good, strong, inspiring leader? Inspiring leader, yeah. I'm sure. Um, Gary Ridge who just recently retired and CEO from WD-40. Honorable, oh. honorable guy. I know, WD-40, exactly. Uh, Barry Waymiller um, is the company. Bob Chapman, the CEO of, Bob, of Barry Waymiller, super honorable, super inspiring, also lives with cause, you know? Um, I, you know, there, there, are, there are lots of good examples of people who are, who are not famous, I was going to say they're not social media. They're not. They're not. Which no, is they're not. They're generally not on social media, but they are. They are honorable, and they give their people something to believe in, and they care about their people, and they view their people as human beings, um, and they recognize that they, as leaders, have the responsibility to see those around them rise. They embrace that awesome responsibility. That's what makes them great leaders. So. I want to I, I, a few more minutes, and I know I've been, you've been super generous with your time, so thank you. I appreciate it. Um, I have no idea what time it is. So oh, I, 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 I don't, know, I don't know if I have been generous or not. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, neither do I. I have no idea. I think it's been, I don't have no idea. How long? <laughs> An hour and a half. So, yeah, I guess it's been probably longer than you were anticipating. Um, what I was going to say. I got free water. So I'm you happy. do. And uh, believe me, you can get way more. There's way more where that came from. And I have snacks, I told you. Do you Amazing. still have a snack? No, still I'll okay? have a snack afterwards. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Yes. I've got some healthy ones for you. Uh, some of these things when I was going down the, the rabbit hole with you, which I have before, not just to yesterday or the day before there are all these like little rules of success that I've seen you do in these, all these different um, montages like that are on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And a few of them that I, these are the ones I really love. You say, be the last to speak. Mm -hmm. I love that. Can you talk about that one? Yeah, that's a story about, uh, that comes from a story about uh, Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela is a very important leader because um, different leaders are viewed differently depending on where you go. Mm -hmm. uh, but Nelson Mandela is universally regarded as a great leader no matter where you go. That's true. And um, he was asked by a journalist once, how did you learn to be a great leader? And he told the story of when he was a boy. Um, he was actually the son of a tribal chief. And he said he remembered going to tribal meetings with his father. And he remembers two things. One, they always sat in a circle. And two, his father was always the last to speak. And if you think about it, even well-intentioned leaders, we come in and we sit at the head of the table, mm -hmm. you know, 
and we say to the team, okay, here's the problem we have. This is what I think we should do, but I want to know what you think. Too late. You've biased the room or you've made people feel like your, their opinion doesn't matter. As opposed to sitting down and saying, here's the problem. I want to know what you think. And then being good at having a poker face, you can ask questions, but not giving away if you agree or disagree. And at the end, you can have the exact same opinion as you came in with, but two things happen. A, you actually get the benefit of more input. Right. Um, so you actually may change your point of view. And other people feel like they could contribute. Ever feel like they were contributing because they because they were. Right. Um, so yeah, I, it is a fantastic practice um, to literally practice being the last to speak. That is, I love that one. And it's such a good, I think that's such a great one. Um, outdo yourself. Yeah, I mean, the only true competitor in the infinite game is yourself. It doesn't matter if you beat another player in the game. The question is, are you outdoing yourself? You know, it's, it's uh, compare it to like, you know, I get a kick out of like the Olympics, mm -hmm. right? So these are the most elite athletes in the world. Yep. And, you know, maybe there's a, let's say there's a skier, an ice skater, and they got the gold medal. But if you go look at their routine, they fell. But it just so happened that the person who got silver fell twice. Right. So right. are they the best, you know, skier, ice skater or whatever, the, you know, in the world? No, in this competition, they were better than that person that day. Yep. Right. Um, um, and so I think what and, and that's a finite game. You know, there's a beginning, middle and end to that game. It's an actual competition in our careers. There's no beginning, middle and end until you reach the end of your career and then you don't win career. Like you didn't, you, right. you know, and so the goal is not to try and outdo other people. The goal is to try to outdo yourself. How am I a better leader, a, a, a better follower? And by the way, the best leaders, the best followers, all the best leaders that I've ever met believe that they're in service to something even bigger than themselves. Mm. The best leaders are the best followers. They don't believe that the buck stops here. Even the Pope feel is in, is in service to something bigger than himself. He's not actually the end top end all being. The best leaders, and even the ones I mentioned, you know, Gary Ridge and Bob Chapman, both of them believe there there's a higher calling. Both of them believe they're in service to something even bigger, even if it's just looking after people and making them feel like they belong. Right. Um, so I don't use the term follower and leader as a hierarchy, mm -hmm. right? Because leaders can happen at every point of an organization. At the top of the organization, you better be a follower. Um, That's great. Um, um, but yeah, I've never heard anyone say that actually. It's true. Yeah, but it's true. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so I think the, yeah, I think that that's true, which is the game that we're in is to outdo ourselves. And we wish everybody else the best of luck. You know, remember, two people can both be wildly successful in their careers simultaneously. And in business, two companies who sell the same thing for about the same product, about the same price, about the same quality, can both be wildly successful simultaneously. Like there is no winner. It's a joke. It's a, it's a false construction. And so why not make our products, our service, our work better than we were yesterday? Like that's the goal. I think I saw, I think you talked about this in a lot of your speeches actually about like when you walk into Apple or I, I don't know if you actually did it or, or uh, when it was like Microsoft and like people either focused on what the competition was doing and that kind of like derailed their business versus like focusing on themselves and making their, like yeah. thinking what they're doing, how they can be better, how they can Back in the Steve Ballmer days, Steve Ballmer was obsessed with beating Apple. Right. And he sort of very publicly said, you know, and pushed his people to make a better iPod. Like we're going to make the, right. you know, we're going we're gonna to beat Apple at their iPod. And Apple wasn't competing against Microsoft. They didn't care. They were doing themselves. And so congratulations. It's true. At some point, um, arguably Microsoft's Zune uh, actually was better than Apple's iPod. But for the fact that a couple of years later, Apple invented the iPhone. That's right. Rendering both the iPod and the Zune completely obsolete. So it makes no sense to try and make a better product if your competition's not even playing the same game. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, one more. The stack the deck to your favor. Yeah. Yes. Um, so the best way to understand that is um, I don't believe in the concept of strengths and weaknesses. Everything has context. Um, um, I believe we have attributes, we have characteristics that we have to know and in some contexts, those attributes are strengths and in some times they're weaknesses. So I'll give you the example that I like to use all the time because it's funny, is I am uh, chronically disorganized. I'm very disorganized, right? You are? Terribly, yeah. Um, uh, and, uh, um, and I've always thought of this as a weakness. Simon, what are your weaknesses? I'm disorganized, right? Yeah. 
So I was at a, a networking event many years ago in the early days of my career. And I met a guy and he was like, Simon, you're fantastic. would love to work with you. Here's my card. Now, if I was organized, I'd be texting from the cab on the way home or emailing the next day when I get to work, you know, of course. But I'm disorganized. I lost the business card almost immediately, <laughs> right? Uh, two weeks later, I found the business card at the bottom of a briefcase. And so I emailed him. I said, I don't know if you remember me. We met two weeks ago. You know, I'd love to reconnect. And he wanted to work with me more because he thought I was busy. He thought there was such high demand for yes, me. Yes, that's why you took so long. To right, that's why I took so long. Yes. So is being disorganized a strength or a weakness? The answer is it depends. In that context, it was actually a strength. In different contexts, when somebody says, I need you to get this done by this time, it can be a liability. So what stacking the deck means is putting yourself in situations where your attributes are more likely to reveal themselves as strengths and try and avoid situations where your attributes are more likely to pull you back, right? So stacking the deck is not about cheating. It's about it's about making sure that you're in the right place that make you strong and avoiding the places that make you weak. You know. So for example, if you're bad at math, don't do jobs that require lots of math, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Like it's 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 it's. I know it sounds trite, but no, it's like, true. It's, it's sometimes that silly. You know. Um, like I love working with others. I, I love working on teams, right? And so when a project comes up, I always make sure that I have a group that I can work with because I know I'll do better work. If I work by myself, it's more stressful and the work is a, a lower standard. And so I know that about me. I know that I have a, I, I like working with people. So I stack the deck. I try very hard to work at least with other, one other person or to work on, 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 a, on a team to complete a project, right? Right. As opposed to, leave this to me, I'll get this done by myself. Some people, that is their strength to work by themselves, not me. Right. right? So again, I try and stack the deck by working with people as often as possible when I have difficult things to do. So you don't like the word strength or weakness. What word did you say you like? You like? I mean, we use strength and weakness because it is relative. But yeah. the point is, that it's not that I'm so anti the words. It's, it's more like recognize that it is relative. What are your, okay, synonym for strength? What are your, like, because. What, 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 what are my characteristics and attributes that I have? Yes. So I'm, I'm a, I like team, I like working with somebody. Yeah, you're a team player. I'm a team player. Yeah. Not, sometimes a strength, sometimes a weakness. Okay, what other right? ones? Um, I think out loud. Sometimes a strength, sometimes a weakness, right? Um, um, you know, I, I, I think quickly, sometimes too quickly, right? Sometimes a strength, sometimes a weakness. You know, sometimes things need more consideration, right? Right. So none of these things are, are advantages or disadvantages depends on the context. They're not inherently strong or weak. Got it. And I think we make that mistake. We label, we, 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 think, we say things about ourselves and we label them strong or weak, which is, and then what happens if, you know, somebody's look at all their strengths and look at all my weaknesses. Now we're comparing ourselves and we're destroying our confidence. But in the right context, all of your weaknesses have strengths. And in the wrong context, all of your strengths are, are liabilities. You have a big ego, that guy's great. In the wrong context, it's all, it's, it's, it comes across as, uh, as conceit. Right. You know, or, uh, uh, or, or excessive, you know? Um, so yeah, I, I just think we have to stop judging whether something is strong or weak and just label what it is, what the behavior is, what the attribute is. Do you watch TV? Of course. Okay. What is your favorite TV show? I mean, it depends on, you know, it's gonna you know, depend on, but, it's always uh, it depends it. on the context. <laughs> exactly. It depends uh, no, on the I context. love, I love, uh, the great British bake off. The great oh, British baking show. you like that show? Love. Love, because to me that is an embodiment of what life should be, which is a competition where we help each other. Ah. Like how good is that? They're competing. There is a winner. Yeah. People get thrown off the show every single episode. Yeah. And if it were an American show, they building all of this drama and like this person hurt me and because that's what we do in America. We make it a competition. Well, they're competing against each other and they help each other. Yeah. I mean, that's what to me the beauty of that show is. It's it's sort of like what I imagine the world that's should a, that's should a, be I like. like okay, yeah. what's your favorite movie? Uh, I mean, I, I'm a huge Star Wars fan. So, you know, I like the Star Wars franchise. I like the, many of the TV shows that that franchise has produced and a lot of the movies too, so. What's your favorite book? Um, that's a harder one for me because I don't read much. Um, Do you listen to books? No, I don't. I, I have a pretty bad case of ADHD and so I love the idea of books. Yeah. But I struggle to read them and everybody thinks I'm really well read. Um, yeah, that's exactly what I would have I, thought. I'm too. not. Um, I joke that I've written more books than I've read, which is true. Really? Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> I 
love and I, I love and that I, you said that. And I carried a lot of shame about it for a long time because you know we all think we have to be readers to be totally. know, to get ahead in the world or to be smart. And so I hid the fact for many years that I didn't read books. I love buying books. I love the idea of books. I, you know, it's not that I'm anti. It's just I struggle with it. Right. And so uh, I've read some of a lot of books. Um, right. That's <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, you too. I've started a lot of books. <laughs> Um, and I have stacks of books next to my bed, of which I intend to get to them one day. And, one day. And, you know. But uh, yeah, I, I prefer, I, I learn from conversations and talking to people because I struggle to read. Do you listen to podcasts besides mm. your own maybe? or? I mean, again, it's one of those things like I never know when. I mean, sure, I've listened to episodes here and there, but I. I it's not, not really what you're. No. So like, what I should. You, I like the idea of it again. Like, because how often do you do your podcast? Uh, we, we, we have seasons. Um, so we do it once a week. You do it once a week uh, when we're, when we were in season. Yeah. And then what, so what do you do when you're not traveling and doing speaking? Like what, what do you do for fun? Um, I love the arts. Okay. So I'm, um, I love making art and I love seeing art. And Are you an artist? Uh, I, I take photographs. Yeah. Oh, um, and, uh, um, but I like visiting. I like going to museums and galleries and, and performances and concerts. And, and I, you know, I miss New York. I miss the, the, yeah. the, the fact that there was so much talent everywhere um, in New York. I yeah. definitely miss New York, the art scene. Um, but I love art. I I'm, I'm do it an incredible amount of Lego. You do yeah, with I your with your niece and nephew. Oh, no, they let them do it themselves. I do. I, yeah. You do it your, really? Yeah. No, I, of course I occasionally do it with them. Yeah, I do do Lego with them. But I have Lego upstairs if you want to use. I them. do Lego by myself a lot. Like I have s stacks and stacks of Lego sets that you know I pull them out and I do one. Do you do puzzles too? I like puzzles a lot. Yeah, uh, I like uh, I like Liberty puzzles. You know those? Which ones are the Liberty ones? Oh my god, they're the best. Which ones are those? I thought I knew about like. Yeah, no, they're the best. What makes them so the best? They're not normal jigsaw puzzles. They're wood and they're cut out in all these wonderful different shapes. And so, you know, usually when you do a jigsaw puzzle, first you do the frame. Yep. You can't because there's no, there's no frame pieces. Like they don't exist. Oh. You have to, it's kind of, they're kind of, they're magical. Yeah. Liberty puzzles are the best. Oh, wow. Yeah. I love that. Do you know how to do a Rubik's cube? Just because I would think you'd be good at it. No. 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 Yeah. I mean, I'm plenty nerdy, but I think the, I think people's assumptions, like I'm a big reader that does Rubik's cubes and you know, it's like, it's so funny how, yeah. Yeah. I'm, that's why I want to know no, who I'm you not are. Good, I'm not good I'm at so, Rubik's cubes. No. no. Like, as but a, I like New York times spelling bee. I love word games. I love, I love Scrabble. Wordle? I love Scrabble. I, I, I went, I was, I had my Wordle phase and I got, I'll be honest with you. I got, I got sick of it. What the New York times bought it. Like they started doing like words that I didn't even know were words. Like right. it stopped being fun. Exactly. You know, it's just supposed to be a silly fun game that takes five minutes. Like stop, you know? Exactly. So I actually stopped doing Wordle. I do do the New York Times spelling bee, which I love. I do love crossword puzzles. I love Scrabble. I love word games. I love Boggle. Do you ever play Boggle? Boggle. Oh my God, I haven't played Boggle in years. I love Boggle. Oh my God. It's a very noisy game, but I like it It's a lot. the best game ever. Yeah, it's great. Boggle's great. Boggle's the best game I mean, ever. totally inspired me. I want to play Boggle now. Right? I play it all the time. I, I mean, I, I hate to say it, but I love that game. Yeah, no, I love Boggle. That's like one of my favorite pastimes. Yeah. And then, what? so like when you were younger, this is just me, my, my curiosity about you. Like when you were young, before all this, like how were you as a teenager? Like were you always very thoughtful? Were you always optimistic? Were you- like, I mean, you'll have to ask my family and friends, you know, uh, nerdy and dorky is probably what my sister would say. You know, I was, I was nerdy and dorky. I mean- Did you I'm, play sports? I mean, I was athletic, but not an athlete. Okay. So I played- like I ran, but not on the team. And I played tennis, but not on the team. You know, like I was athletic. I still right. am athletic, but I'm not an athlete. Were you a good student? Good enough. Yeah. I was, wasn't was like straight A great student. I mean, I was fine. Are you still in the RAND Corporation as, as an advisor or? Yeah, I think I'm still on the, I haven't, I haven't worked or, with them in a while, but yeah, I think I'm still in the system. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds pretty good anyway. RAND is cool. Yeah. Rand That's is, amazing. RAND is a big, very cool think tank. And I've had amazing meetings and amazing difficult conversations. I love people who are smarter than me. I, right. I think that to me, that's like, I don't read, but I do love spending time with people who are much smarter than me. I, I, I'm invigorated by it. Who is one of the people that you thought was like, who you're really impressed by, who like just really you were inspired by that you spent time with? I mean, there's a long list. Um, just give me one or two. Well, there's names that you don't know. I mean, like they, they, you know, there's a lot of folks in the military who are some of the smartest people I know right. and who 
see the world in a way that nobody else doesn't ask questions in the way that nobody else doesn't. If I can spend all my time with them, I would be much smarter. Do you have a mentor or did you have a mentor? Or? I think it's important to have mentors. Yeah. I mean, I don't have a mentor anymore. I mean, I've, I have a, a group of people that I call on a regular basis. If I'm stuck or I can't figure something out, I'll, I, I believe in sounding boards. I think anybody who thinks that they have to make every decision by themselves is, is setting themselves up for eventual collapse. Right. You know, I think it's very important to get alternative points of view, uh, to get counsel, to be open to the counsel as opposed to fighting with them to prove that you're right. Um, and just bounce ideas. And I don't make big or difficult decisions without talking to somebody first. My sister and I are a very good team. Um, and uh, rarely do I make difficult decisions without checking in with her first. She's a very good, um, she's a very good sounding very good board. Sounding board. Yeah, very talented. Yeah. That is so nice. Does she work with you at the company? Yeah, yeah we work together. Yeah. There's three partners, and my sister, my sister Sarah, Sarah is one of them. Oh, that's so nice. Yeah, and, and my other partner. And like, we're just like the three of us have like the most complimentary skill set. It's really. It's very special. It's I've been looking for something like that for a long time. That's really nice. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I think basically I've taken up like hours of your time, uh, probably like two. <laughs> You're falling asleep over there. Um, thank you. I don't know what else to say. You've been a phenomenal. You've been a phenomenal guest. Thank you. And I'm so thankful and, and happy and grateful that we that you you did this because Thanks. like I said I've been you've been requested so many times I can't That's like, very nice thank you I, I should show you my like list of like emails and dms but people like how come you don't haven't ever had simon saying like so many That's very nice thank you well thanks for having me I appreciate it I really I I, lo I love meeting you and thank I appreciate you. it a lot of fun thank you thank you